From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. Last week, U.S. Homeland Security sounded the alarm publicly for the first time. What we saw unfolding at Capitol Hill on 6 January with our mouths hanging open might just be the beginning. Don, it is striking just how many people are former veterans who are now accused of attacking the U.S. Capitol. USA! USA! They came to Washington, trained in warfare, wearing combat gear, marched up the steps to the Capitol building, and then used their training against the U.S. Capitol. QAnon, the Boogaloo movement, the Proud Boys, names once lurking on the fringes of the internet are now making mainstream headlines. And it seems like everyone's talking about the domestic threat to the United States. But these movements have been building up for years. Trumpism brought them to the surface. Experts tracing this say the conditions that led to this historic state of affairs did not evaporate when President Joe Biden took office. In today's episode, Amar Nath Amarasingham, a renowned researcher on terrorism and political violence, explains what could be next for the American far right and whether there are some global parallels to how they operate. Hello, Amar. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me. A lot of security experts have been drawing a lot of parallels recently between the U.S. right wing radicalization efforts and those of other more hierarchical extremist organizations like ISIS, for instance, in terms of their recruitment and the way the people are radicalized and just their huge online structures. Do you agree with that comparison? I mean, to some extent, I do. I think a lot of these organizations or movements act the same way. They try to recruit people in in, in very similar ways offline and online. But I, I do often caution against those kinds of comparisons because for me as an academic, I mean, comparisons have to produce some sort of comparative insight. And and it's not often clear what comparing these movements actually leads to because, I mean, obviously the reasons for some of these movements that arose in Iraq and Syria are fundamentally different than what we're seeing in the U.S. and Canada. And so to some extent, I agree that these groups and movements act and and recruit in the same way. But I do think we have to be careful with those comparisons because they're fundamentally different groups. Right. And as you mentioned, there are fundamental differences there. And obviously, there might be different strategies needed to combat this on the part of of the U.S. government. Post 9-11, a lot of people are saying the U.S. has developed this counterterrorism architecture that's more transnational national or international in nature. And now they're looking at this loose sort of amalgamation of groups on U.S. soil with their First and Second Amendment rights and all of the complications, which probably, let's say, when security establishment is dealing with ISIS members overseas, it doesn't have. And that's where it gets tricky. So how tough do you think will law enforcement agencies be in tracking these groups down and stopping them? And what differences might we see in terms of how they do this? I mean, the main difference, of course, is that these international groups are listed terrorist entities. And so the way you deal with them from a law enforcement perspective is fundamentally different. I mean, you have more tools at your disposal, you can cut off fundraising, you can cut off open recruitment and those kinds of things, which you can't do with these domestic groups because they're not listed terrorist entities and there's no domestic terrorism statute in the United States. And so a lot of these groups for the longest time have been recruiting out in the open, have been operating fairly untouched and so on. And so that is a major difference. But I will I will add that if you look at some of the last the arrests and disrupted plots over the last little while, the FBI seems to be all over this threat, right? So I, I do think that we need to separate the kind of political conversation that's happening in the U.S. with the law enforcement conversation. We saw several instances, you know, the Michigan, the plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer was disrupted. The old 2016 plot to blow up a Somali community center was disrupted. The 13-member plot in Georgia to attack some Antifa sites had an FBI informant in the group. And so, you know, I think since Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City bombing, the FBI has been quite attuned to the far right threat, at least from a law enforcement perspective. So they recognize the kind of threat it poses domestically. And so on on the one hand, from a law enforcement perspective, they seem to be all over it. But of course, as we saw during the Trump administration, the political willingness to have that conversation was often depends on who's in power and often depends on how willing they are to address the issue. And so it seems like the Biden administration, at least from, from day one, seems to be more open to having that conversation. But I do think the law enforcement strata of the U.S has been quite attuned to this for a long time. 
Right. As you mentioned, the FBI has been all over it, but there's some who would argue that the litmus is kind of different, as with most things, when we're talking about white power movement extremism versus radical Islamist extremism. And there was a lot of conversation about the kind of actions we saw post 9-11 in terms of the surveillance and crackdown on a certain demographic on Muslims. Would you agree with that assessment to some extent? No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think I think who and what is coded as a threat is fundamentally different depending on your religion and your skin color. I mean, I, th- I don't think that's controversial. And I think if we saw what led up to January 6th event, the conversations that we were having that I was sometimes privy to in terms of the U.S. government and think tanks leading up to the election, it was kind of obvious that there's something was going to happen leading up to the election or shortly after. But none of that was publicly really coded as a threat in the same way that, you know, the same way that Black Lives Matter protests were coded as threats or the same way that if a bunch of Muslims with guns showed up at the Capitol, how would that have been treated, right? And and so I, I do think that because these are domestic groups, because they are white nationalist movements, they often get a pass and the kind of threshold for when they become seen as a threat is way further down the line than if they were Muslims or civil rights movements and so on. That is a huge problem. I think there's massive blind spots in the political space, massive blind spots in the law enforcement space when it comes to dozens and dozens of people showing up with automatic rifles at your Capitol building or your you know, state Capitol buildings. They are treated quite differently than if it was anybody else, basically. And and so January 6th, hopefully, was a kind of turning point for that kind of thinking. I'm guessing that going forward, they're going to kind of take these things much more seriously. I think part of the problem was there's a lot of chatter on in the online space. A lot of it is kind of deranged conspiracy theories, crazy conspiracy theories that from a law enforcement perspective, and I have a lot of sympathy for this, is that we don't really know how to look at it as a threat, right? Because if someone's sitting there talking about shape-shifting and humans are actually lizard people, it's not entirely clear whether that's a law enforcement issue, right? And so I kind of sympathize with them on that front is that there's a lot of crazy chatter online. It's, it's very difficult to know what is going to tip over into violence or mobilization and what is going to just kind of live in the dark corners of the internet indefinitely. Right, it is definitely a challenge to filter out all of the noise that we're seeing in terms of these conspiracy theories, which I will come to later. You've been studying similar movements movements and domestic insurgencies around the world. What we're seeing on ground in the U.S., it's essentially an insurgency, isn't it? And keeping these sort of international examples in mind and how these kinds of movements operate, do you feel that the attack on the U.S. Capitol was a culmination point and things are going to turn around now? Or do you feel like this is the beginning of something that might grow? I know there's uh, different schools of thought on this. That's a good way to look at it, because I think one of the trends that we're starting to see is this notion of a majority with a minority complex, right? And, and so it's a turn of phrase that really arose out of the conflict in Sri Lanka, where a group of people who are actually demographically the majority in the country and hold all the power still somehow come to feel embattled and still somehow come to feel like they're victims in the whole thing. And that is very common in places like Sri Lanka, we're seeing now in India and Myanmar and so on. But it wasn't really mainstreamed in the U.S. until fairly recently with the Trump administration, right? So Trump came and said, your country is being taken away from you, make America great again. And what he really meant was all of the cultural loss that uh, the white population has, all the authority that they're losing, all the power that they're losing, I'm going to bring it back for you, right? And, And so there was this notion that even though you are the majority in the country, that white people in the U.S. are the majority, that somehow your power and stature and culture are still being eroded and attacked. And quite naturally, we're seeing this kind of pushback. And so January 6th was kind of the culmination of that, I think. It's been in the works for a while, but I think January 6th was a major turning point, hopefully, for these politicians to see that you can't just allow these groups to fester, promote themselves out in the open, recruit out in the open, fundraise out in the open, and just be completely left untouched because it can have some serious consequences. We'll be right back. A lot of Trump's rhetoric kind of laid the groundwork for all of this. Do you think there's been any impact on these groups and their operations after Trump's disappearance from social media? And we do know that the platforming agitators does help reduce the spread of their ideas and how much people are exposed to them. Losing the presidency was kind of like the ultimate deplatforming, do you think? 
that's the large question that remains for me is that, yeah, he's out of power, he's quiet, but there is a kind of large swath of the American public who are waiting for him to say something, waiting for him to do something. And so the kind of future of the threat kind of depends on where the dust settles, right? Is he going to start a third party? Is he going to show up on some other platform and attract millions of followers there? What is the nature of the conversation going to look like there? What is he calling for people to do? All of that is up in the air because he's been quiet since leaving office. And so that kind of depends where that goes, which is a remarkable thing to say about the United States, right? Because uh, I think the U.S. has never really had that kind of charismatic leadership before or charismatic authority before. You know, it's, it's been largely a kind of fairly boring bureaucracy for a long time. And so to have this person, this one individual command authority like this is quite frightening. And I think depending on where he ends up and what he decides to say, we could see kind of the mutation of this threat or the kind of evolution of this threat in different ways. Let's talk about QAnon, a movement that really came to prominence during this time of Trumpism and is associated with it. There's a lot of uh, news about how this prophecy and conspiracy building that they did to recruit thousands kind of fell apart post President Biden's inauguration. And there's a lot of them posting online about disillusionment and confusion. So what do you think is next? Is it all over in terms of that movement? I don't think so. I think what we know about these kinds of movements, particularly these apocalyptic or millenarian kind of movements, is they find ways to survive. I think a few things will probably start to happen. There'll be the kind of diehard supporters who continue to stay committed to there is a plan and continuously push the can down the road or kick the can down the road for new dates when things are supposed to happen. What we're also starting to see is a whole host of them just vanish, disillusion. And then there's a lot of kind of very depressing posts online in QAnon spaces saying, you know, I've wasted my life for four years. I followed this random plan for four years and it led nowhere. And then I think there's going to be a small minority. And I think there's a fear that this is going to be a large minority. It's going to be fairly small that might trickle into other movements, right? And and so the extent to which that happens, I think we'll have to keep an eye on. Are they going to be recruited into Boogaloo Boys, militia groups, far-right groups, and so on? There's already chatter on Telegram in particular amongst far-right spaces that kind of so-called parlor refugees or, you know, the, the kind of leftover MAGA, the disillusioned MAGA supporters can be recruited into more darker movements. And so I think there's definitely an attempt to try to do that on the far-right, whether these kind of run-of-the-mill Trump supporters supporters fall for that or kind of find themselves in kind of more hardcore ideologies, I think we'll have to see. There is all of that happening, right? And so a lot of things are in flux right now. So we'll have to see where everything ends up. Amar, how concerning is the infiltration of these groups into the American security establishment and law enforcement as we're beginning to find out just now how deep this infiltration might be. And what does that mean in terms of countering this threat in the future? From my experience reporting in Pakistan and Afghanistan, it's when sort of when the ideological extremism infiltrates parts of the security establishment, that's when it things get complicated. And I'm sure you've researched that as well. So what does this say to you? No, I mean, this is a huge problem. And I think it speaks to kind of the blind spots I was talking about earlier, right? If this was a Islamist, if this was a Black Lives Matter person, you know, talking about some of the more hardcore elements of these leftist movements, I think it would have triggered awareness much quicker, right? And so there is this problem of, of the blind spot of, oh, he's just, you know, dabbling in these other movements. He looks like me, he talks like me, he acts like me. He just happens to wear a patch, you know, nothing to worry about. The idea that you could wear a three percenter patch on top of your uniform and nobody says anything, no alarms are raised, is astounding to me. That's going to be a major problem going forward is how do you root out these people? How do you even test for something like that, right? There's been a lot of kind of political pushback saying, we're going to root out the white nationalists, but how do you do that exactly? Are you going to ask them, hey, are you a neo-Nazi? What questions do you ask? How do you test somebody's belief system like that? It's not as easy as people think. And so we are going to have a major problem with, with these individuals who have entered law enforcement or the military to often very purpose get training, right? Get better at handling weapons and so on. What they might do once they start to leave these movements. We saw a case just in Manitoba of a Canadian who, you know, fled to Georgia and was arrested, who was also ex-military. And so there's a massive problem there in terms of why these people enter the military to begin with. Are they doing it just because they want to shoot at something or are they actually purposefully doing it to get training for their ideology? I think keeping an eye on that, that's been a concern for some time uh, in the US and Canada. But again, January 6th might be a turning point to actually look at it more closely. 
And having these armed, trained people as members of this group that dramatically sort of escalates the threat and impact of the violent acts that could occur, does that mean that the Biden administration is going to have to handle rising white nationalism and hard right extremism sooner rather than later? Yeah, they're probably doing that already, right? I think the recognition that January 6th was a major turning point, that they have far-right people in the military, they have far-right people in their police forces, that even Secret Service agents had to be moved around before inauguration because there was some indication that Biden himself might face an insider threat. And the fact that a lot of these protesters were walking around with zip ties 30, 40, 50 feet away from senators and the vice president and members of the House. If that's not a turning point, if that doesn't wake people up to the kind of threats that they're facing from domestic groups, I don't know what else can possibly do that. So I'm hoping that there's a kind of much more conservative effort to look at the domestic groups closely, hopefully get some legal avenues in place as well, but we'll have to see. And as we've been talking about, this is a movement that's been building up for many years now, but a lot of people in the U.S. and around the world are just kind of waking up to the threat post what happened at the Capitol. And now they're just talking about ways to counter it. From your experience of similar movements, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions in the way that all of us are collectively thinking about this threat right now? I mean, for one, these movements aren't new, right? The essay calling for leaderless resistance in the far right was written, I think, in 83 or earlier. So some of these movements and these groups are four or five decades old, and that's not even taking into account uh, the KKK, which is much older than that. And so the idea that these groups are new in the U.S. is not true. I would say the mainstreaming of the ideology of the grievance of the concern, particularly during the Trump administration, is a huge concern. I mean, in no other context would most extremism researchers paid any attention to a group like QAnon, unless President Trump himself and his team were retweeting them hundreds and hundreds of times that people who ascribe to this view were entering Congress and running for Congress, etc. And so the kind of mainstreaming of this idea of these ideologies is growing concern. What that means, of course, is that a lot of the conversation becomes okay, right? Particularly on social media. Social media companies have always had trouble with dealing with when hate comes from from the top, right? And this is why we're seeing what we're seeing in India with the Hindu movement in Myanmar. And so when people in power are the ones spewing the hate speech, social media companies often have a hard time dealing with that because they want to work in these countries, they function through a profit model. And so it's great when they're kind of subnational terrorist groups like ISIS or whatever, you can you know take them offline pretty quickly. But when the person spewing the most hate speech is the president of the United States, that becomes a little bit more difficult to manage. So I think having him gone, I think will just set the tone in a different direction anyway. So we'll see. Thank you so much for your time, Amar. You've been insightful as always. Thank you. I was talking to Amar Nath Amarasingham. He is an associate professor at Queen's University and associate fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. He's well known for his research on terrorism and political violence around the world. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mudher. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden. And our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called. And our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.